Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sandeep Madan. I am anatomy faculty at DAMPS. So today we are going to discuss the anatomy questions of the recent exam. Uh, as we all know, all these questions are purely on the recalled basis. So if you feel like, like uh, the language of the question was a little bit different or maybe one or two options were not exactly as given in the real exam. So in that case, feel free to contact me and also in that case, question, uh, answer can be different as well, right? So, but based on the information that I could get and based on the recall questions, this is what we are going to discuss now, right? So, let us start the discussion. This is question number one, where ligament derived from the mark structure has been asked and according to the student's recall, the mark structure was ventral mesogastrium. So, here what we can see, this is the stomach and uh, this is liver developing liver this is uh, developing liver and here you can see the developing spleen so the liver develops in the ventral mesogastrium it divides the ventral mesogastrium into two parts right if i draw and explain so here we have ventral mesogastrium and the dorsal mesogastrium with respect to stomach this is stomach and here we have the ventral mesogastrium here we have the dorsal mesogastrium so the liver develops here in the ventral mesogastrium liver develops here in the ventral mesogastrium it divides the ventral mesogastrium basically into two parts a and b it is only for our reference that we can say and uh, uh, also we must understand that uh, spleen develops here in the dorsal mesogastrium and the spleen will also develop uh, the dorsal mesogastrium into two parts but in this view it looks like as if whatever is happening in like uh, anterior aspect of the stomach in the ventral uh, part of the stomach the same thing is happening in the dorsal aspect actually we must understand the liver and the spleen they are not of same size so spleen can divide the dorsal mesogastrium only in some part cranial and caudal part remains undivided whereas liver com almost completely divides the ventral mesogastrium so this is actually what happens that when you see this uh, similar orientation but from the lateral view now okay now you can see that this is liver which is almost dividing the ventral mesogastrium here so this part between the anterior wall and the liver it becomes falciform ligament and this part which is between the liver and the stomach along the lesser curvature of the stomach this is called as lesser omentum and also there are certain uh, also there are certain you see uh, peritoneal reflections on the uh, liver those reflections will be seen in the form of triangular ligament and in the form of coronary ligament so overall these are the derivatives of the ventral mesogastrium right where we have falciform ligament where we have uh, lesser omentum we have uh, coronary and the triangular ligaments as well in the dorsal aspect as i said only in some part you see only in this much portion it is dividing uh, the dorsal mesogastrium is dividing into two parts right here one part between stomach and spleen so we say gastrosplenic ligament between the spleen and the kidney which lies along the posterior wall so here we have lino-renal ligament which can also be called as spleno-renal ligament because lenum is the word for the spleen but as i said the cranial part remains undivided it will become gastrophrenic ligament and the caudal part remains undivided that becomes greater omentum so this is what we have to understand about the dorsal mesogastrium and the ventral mesogastrium part okay so that is uh, according to the question now let us look at the question what what the choice is among these choices the question is asking about ligament derived from the mark structure here we have gastrophrenic no that will be on the posterior aspect lino-renal again on the posterior aspect but the answer will be falciform ligament falciform ligament is between the anterior uh, wall and the liver okay so that is one of the derivative and that will be the answer to the question okay let us move ahead and see the uh, next question Next question is a patient presents with the drooping of the angle of the mouth and inability to blow which of the following nerves is involved in the patient. Now patient has inability to blow that is uh, done by the buccinator muscle which is a muscle of facial expression. Also the angle of mouth is drooped when there is paralysis of the seventh nerve. So based on these 
two inputs we can say definite answer is the seventh nerve and uh, regarding in this question although they do, did not have uh, they did not ask about you see uh, where is the angle getting deviated and all but sometimes the questions are framed on that part also so let us look at this way for the deviation thing we must understand there is a rule of 17 there is a rule of 17 and according to this rule we when we look at the nerve and we observe some part for it we can see where will be the deviation so nerve number 7 and 10 cranial nerve number 7 and 10 total it becomes 17 and which part do you observe for the cranial nerve 7 that is the angle of mouth so the angle of mouth deviation is observed for the cranial nerve 7 and for the 10th it is the uvula usually we see the uvula deviation where is the uvula deviated angle of the mouth and the uvula both will be deviated towards the normal side that means if the left sided nerves are gone it will be the right side deviation okay the normal side will be the right side in that case if the left is injured okay so if you compare this scenario with the other nerve that is cranial nerve 5 and the cranial nerve 12 again the total is 17 and here what you can observe is the jaw deviation what you can see is the angle uh, you see the tip of tongue tip of tongue these deviations will be seen on protrusion on protrusion these deviation will be seen towards abnormal side that means if the left sided nerves are gone deviation will be again towards left side this is all for the element type of injury and this is how you can understand rule of 17 okay and now um, in this question is a very straightforward question question answer is cranial nerve 7 let us move to the next question a patient with the history of pain in both legs while taking long walk and he has developed toe gangrene maybe the history was there maybe the picture was there for the toe gangrene and he admits to have erectile dysfunction or maybe some other features were there so which of the following artery is involved in this patient so basically the history is like given for the uh, usually erectile dysfunction also for the lower limb involvement okay and uh, let me tell you that uh, i have this uh, telegram group by the name Dr. Sandeep Dam's Anatomy. On 3rd of March, I put the same similar question here. In this question, the concept remains the same. Okay, the question was the patient is having uh, the erectile dysfunction, also, patient was having the pain in the legs. So basically, the lower limb involvement and um, this uh, like uh, you can say the uh, his like uh, sexual life involvement because of the erectile dysfunction because of this vessels involvement so when such type of uh, scenario is there we are looking at uh, the higher relation little bit higher relation because we see the lower limbs are supplied by the femoral artery which is the continuation of external iliac so external iliac basically is for you can say majorly for the lower limb part internal iliac which is the artery of uh, you see uh, the pelvic cavity right so in that case uh, in that case uh, in a patient this given patient internal iliac is also involved and external iliac is also involved and that too on both sides because both the legs are involved here okay and here uh, uh, you can see that we have the iota iota gets bifurcated into two common iliac arteries and common iliac arteries further bifurcate into internal and external iliac artery like this so you have the abdominal iota which is getting bifurcated here okay and what are these arteries these arteries are common iliac artery common iliac artery these arteries are internal iliac artery and this is external iliac artery okay this is external iliac artery and uh, now you can understand that if there is a lesion at this level that is iota iliac junction this junction in that case uh, both side arteries will be affected right and uh, um, that will be uh, explaining the patient's symptom right that will be explaining the patient's symptom so answer should be iota iliac junction okay and uh, uh, this is what i have all so this is uh, like on uh, the similar concept i posted the question so I will suggest that on and off you must visit this group. You can see the 
discussions over there you can ask your doubts also okay so let us move ahead to the next question patient presents with ballistic involuntary movements which of the following is responsible this is very straightforward type of question and uh, like uh, answer to the question is the subthalamic nucleus because subthalamic nucleus involvement will lead to the ballistic type of movements very abrupt violent type of girdle movements will be seen and uh, this caudate nucleus which is a part of uh, uh, striatum or the neostriatum along with the putamen we say it's a neostriatum that involvement uh, uh, will lead to the other type of uh, you see uh, movement disorders again but that is not described as ballistic movements okay and the substantia nigra substantia nigra involvement if it is primarily pathogenesis of the substantia nigra is there dopamine level at the level of stratum will be gone down and that will lead to you see uh, parkinson's movement right so uh, that is again a movement disorder but that is not ballistic so ballistic is particularly for hemibilismus bilismus these type of words are for the subthalamic nucleus now this question where this histological picture was given and uh, we, we were asked to identify this so it is uh, so answer to this question is fibrocartilage or white fibrocartilage okay you can say white fibrocartilage because it looks like white only and uh, maybe the cartilage for the elastic was given as yellow elastic cartilage but anyway uh, answer to this question is fibrocartilage why fibrocartilage because we can see in this given picture there are parallel rows of the fibers and in between parallel rows of the cells so very disciplined type of behavior this is how we identify this okay let me show you all these cartilages over there so if you look at the other cartilages also here what we can see is the hyaline cartilage is there in the hyaline cartilage what we can see is the cell are cells are present in the groups cells are present in the groups groups so all these are the groups cell nests are there okay these are cell nest so cells are present in the group this is one feature but do you see any fiber in the matrix no fibers are not seen are they present yes so fibers are present but not seen this is exactly just like suppose we have a glass and sometimes we see through the glass so similarly what is happening fibers are there we are not able to see them so that is glassy appearance or hyalose appearance because of such appearance we say this is hyaline cartilage this is hyaline cartilage okay and if you compare this with another cartilage here we have look at this picture here what you can see cells are present singly yes mostly singly maybe somewhere in the groups also but what is the important feature here that you can see the long wavy fibers small wavy fibers these are all elastic fibers collagen fibers so these elastic fibers give the name to this cartilage as elastic cartilage okay and now if you compare these two pictures with the third type of cartilage this will be like this here you can see that uh, we have parallel rows of fibers in between parallel rows of cells now why such disciplined behavior is there and this cartilage if you see this is fibrocartilage but why such such discipline behavior if if we, we can understand this way if we write the cartilage if we write the cartilage as cartilage if we write the cartilage as cartilage it will tell us that it is having collagen type 2 fibers in this it is having collagen type 2 fibers in this and if we write bone bone will tell us that it is having type 1 fibers in it so basically the fib collagen fibers of the bone are type 1 fibers which are very very strong fibers very tough fibers but type 2 fibers they belong to cartilage usually okay but uh, in case of fibrocartilage although this is a cartilage it is having type 1 plus 2 both the collagens are there and type 1 is the dominant here so it is having the fibers of bone so it is that tough do you appreciate that is why that is why there is a this much uh, uh, you see discipline behavior is there okay so we are done with this question answer to this question is to identify so answer was fibrocartilage and we know by now uh, how to identify the other type of cartilages as well okay 
and in this question there was one more question uh, in this uh, uh, paper there was one more question on the histology as well and there one histological slide was given and we were asked to identify uh, like this question what are these structures identify the mars structure in the given picture so uh, in the given question basically uh, the mars structure answer to this question is islets of langerhans let me explain uh, like why these are the answer here see we can see in the picture if you zoom in we can see the acini are there right these are the acini these are all the acini this is the exocrine part of the pancreas so pancreas is a gland where we have exocrine as well as endocrine part and uh, this acini are the exocrine part which will create which will produce the pancreatic juice but this part here is the endocrine part where we have islets and how to identify islets in the slide of pancreas uh, we can identify islets like islets are of bigger size than the surrounding acini this is one point and within the acini usually we have the blood vessels the capillaries are there okay so this is what let me show you the other images here we can see this is how the acini are present these are all surrounding acini are there you can see the surrounding acini are there and in between you can see this this the acinous part is basically the exocrine part i hope you understood that and here what you can see this is the islet this is the islet of langerhans and this islet is uh, basically the endocrine part and because it is endocrine part it does not have the ducts exocrine part have the ducts so whatever secretions are being produced by the these acini those will be carried by the ducts of the pancreas but the endocrine part does not have the duct that's why they are like endocrines are ductless glands we know that and that is why we need the blood capillaries over there so that whatever they are producing the uh, islet cells whatever they are producing they must put their secretion they must produce their put their hormones in the blood so the blood can carry because the ducts are not even there okay so this is one thing and we can see here this is the enlarged picture and there you can see the acini you can appreciate the islet cells also in between you can see the capillaries okay this is the mechanism and this is how it is happening it is happening there and this is about the pancreatic islet cells but the what about the other choices which were given in the question let us look at them so there was this uh, lymphatic nodule one of the option was lymphatic nodule i can show you this slide is of the lymph node and here in the lymph node what you can see is the capsule and below the capsule if you follow this this is a com you can see this is a space is a complete space right like between the capsule and the uh, you see the lymphatic nodules we we call this as subcapsular sinus so subcapsular sinus is a typical feature of lymph node and within the lymph node we have this is the cortex part and this is the medulla part and within the cortex you can see this is lymphatic nodule lymphatic nodule lymphatic nodule all these are nothing but the collection of lymphatic nodules and if you zoom in you can see the lymphatic nodules are having outer dark part and inner pale part and this inner pale part is called as germinal center inner pale part is called as germinal center so whatever lymph comes through this the lymph will get filtered by passing through the lymphatic nodules and within the lymphatic nodules we have the lymphocytes they will take whatever immunity reactions they needed to do they will do it here and after that all the filtered lymph will be collected in the medullary sinuses and after that it will be carried by the efferent ductules and that will be carried to the next level of the lymph node this is how the lymph will keep on flowing through the series of the lymph nodes and it will be getting filtered uh, during its pathway right so that is this is how we can identify the lymphatic nodule let us look at the other options here in this one of the choice was demi lune let me describe what is demi lune so basically when you look at the salivary gland we have like two type of secretions are there in the salivary glands uh, like serous type of secretion and the mucus type of secretion so this acinus which you can see which is very dark looking here is serous acinus why it is dark looking because when we did the staining of this slide because of the serous nature this acinus took up the stain well that is why it is appearing dark but this light mucus here which we can see is it looks like light you know this is actually having the mucus in it and it could not take the stain well that is why uh, after staining only we can see the colors isn't it 
it is already filled with the mucus did not take the stain well that's why it is appearing light so light sni equals mucus sni dark sni equals serous sni but in some of the areas we observe that if i zoom in if you can focus here that this is half moon shape capping of the serous sinus of the mucus sinus by serous sinus see this is the mucus sinus over this we have serous sinus which is making half moon shape capping so half moon shape cap on the mucus sinus it is made by the serous sinus such arrangement is called as demi lune such arrangement is called as demi lune this is serous demi lune do you appreciate so this is seen in case of the salivary glands but it won't be seen in the parotid gland why because parotid gland is pure serous gland so if it is having only serous glands uh, serous sni that means there is no mucus sinus is present but to make the demi lune there should be a uh, presence of both mucus and serous uh, sinus isn't it so that is what it will be observed in the submandibular gland it can be observed in the sublingual gland as well but not in the parotid gland and this i have taken from the sublingual and the third which was asked in the glomerulus like glomerulus if you if you get a glomerulus slide you, the picture will be from like kidney uh, this is the slide of the kidney and here you will observe that glomerulus are just like round round structures will be there but surrounding these glomeruli there should be uh, some tubules should be there so these are all convoluted tubules i hope you understood now so this if such type of appearance is there and in between some uh, other ducts in the form of medullary rays or some other features should also be there so based on all the features you have to identify uh, okay what is the slide and what is the marked structure in that slide so according to this question the should answer should be islets of the langer hand but as i said it is all pure recalled basis right now let us look at this part here identify the mark bone identify the mark bone like this is straightforward question we have this bone as the malleus this is incus and this is tapir so answer to this question will be incus okay which has been marked and let us look at the basic features of these bones and here what you can see if you look at the uh, malleus bone what is the important here is to understand that we have the handle of the malleus we do have the anterior process and the lateral process of the malleus and malleus makes an articulation with the incus so this is the incus articulation uh, site for the incus articulation similarly when you look at the incus now you have two processes where basically we call it as like limbs like long limb short limb and one site for the malleus articulation for the steps part we have the foot plate we have the limbs like which is making a loop here right and this is the head of the same now you can say that between the ear ossicles like we have three ear ossicles malleus incus and steps and here in between these we have uh, the two joints also we have two joints between one between malleus and incus other between incus and steps so here we can say we have one mnemonic that is miss ball and using this mnemonic we can remember which joint is of what type so this s is what saddle this s is what saddle and this ball is what ball and socket so first remember miss ball is our mnemonic then write saddle and ball and socket and here you can see we have this joint between malleus and incus and the other joint is between these two ear ossicles so the first joint is of saddle variety and the second joint is of ball and socket variety so simply remember miss ball and this will help you understanding okay this is the saddle and the ball and socket type of joint so we are done up to this next question uh, yeah this question the patient complains of the headache with the periorbital pain lacrimation was there Slivation was there, jaw spasm was there with the light and accommodation reflex normal, pupil neither dilated nor constricted and the base of skull uh, with some nerves or some foramen were there. So based on that information we have to mark what is our answer here. So let me talk about this. Uh, the, uh, see these recalled symptoms they point towards involvement of the trigeminal nerve like everyone knows about it and there is no doubt okay but um, uh, for the identification of the structure you see here what has been given to us 
is the second nerve optic nerve is given third nerve is given fifth nerve and the seventh nerve is given now obviously when the pupil is uh, there is no change no reflex is lost accommodation light pupil is also not changed third nerve is definitely no loss there okay and other other features also they point towards definite answer should be trigeminal nerve okay and among these options c is the trigeminal nerve but how to identify let us look at all the structures i have put here so you can see this is the optic nerve right this is the optic nerve and this is the third nerve a holomotor nerve this is the fourth nerve here and this is the fifth nerve now third uh, fourth nerve and the fifth nerve fourth is the thinnest fifth is the thickest thinnest and thickest they lie next to each other and another thing if you observe the fifth nerve is present in this cave and this cave does not look like bony cave because if you compare this cave with this part now this part is definitely looks like it's a bone within the bone we have a hole or meatus this is internal acoustic meatus for the seventh nerve this is seventh nerve this is eighth nerve all right so if i write down this is second nerve third nerve fourth nerve and this is fifth nerve then where is sixth these two nerves are sixth okay what about ninth this is ninth tenth eleventh and this is twelfth so these are the cranial nerves which are seen at the base of the skull part and this is the orientation see all the nerves are arranged in this way but the cranial nerve six the abducens nerves are going forward they will be passing through the duralus canal then they will be passing through the cavernous sinus and they will be coming out of the superior orbital fissure okay and i have included these uh, labeled pictures for your you see uh, for your revision okay you can see those pictures whatever i have marked uh, with the pen the same thing have been um, labeled here okay so based on that information trigeminal nerve was the answer let us look at the next uh, question the patient who underwent varicose vein surgical treatment now presents with the loss of sensation in the medial leg so this question is basically repeat from the last year exam and here the uh, medial leg sensations are lost and the varicose vein treatment was there so great saphenous vein was you see the surgery was done for that and the accompanying nerve is saphenous nerve so that's why answer should be saphenous nerve and here you can see this is the medial aspect and we can see the vein is the great saphenous vein which is accompanied by the saphenous nerve okay but if you look at the short saphenous vein the short saphenous vein which is coming in the lateral aspect it it begins but it does not run in the lateral leg it runs in the posterior leg and then it will be accompanied by the sural nerve eventually this vein will be piercing uh, into this part and entering the popliteal fossa where it will be uh, draining into the popliteal vein okay so that is what answer to this question should be a saphenous nerve because the great saphenous vein uh, was indicated there so that was all which i could collect thank you so much everyone feel free to contact me if you have any doubt or any query my best wishes Thank you very much everyone.